afternoon, everybody. We're entering a new era of marketing, an era of unprecedented change, seismic external disruption, huge technology shifts, and the biggest changes in shopper behavior in a generation. Not to mention climate change, the ever-looming COVID, and what is turning out to be the new Cold War. Navigating this chaotic world is what will differentiate brands who will win and those who will lose. It requires agility, bravery and foresight. It's really kind of boring, isn't it? It's really not new. So let's try and talk about something that is new, something that is a little exciting. The one thing that is new and is real is that the gut instincts, the hunches that we have had in marketing and advertising to understand human beings just will not see you as far tomorrow as they did yesterday. When I started in advertising a very long time ago, there was a planning director in one of the largest agencies in London that did all of his qual work through six people in his gym. Now, I'm not saying that that is wrong, and I'm not saying that that is bad, but I'm saying at best it's a mildly informed hunch. In your organizations today, the CEOs and the boards are asking different questions of marketing to become the strategic tool in the growth engine. They're demanding more understanding of the what, the when, the how, but also combined with how much, how often, how many. And of course, let's not forget of how long can we do it for, how much more can we sell to them. So can advertising and marketing really deliver a true ROI? Sure it can. Can it be bought and served more efficiently? Yes, of course it can. Can you really understand the true customer of today? Yes, you definitely can. So for those reasons, we're just saying right now, the hunches are dead, they've gone. You can't rely on them, and you've got to ensure and understand they're not coming back. I used to think that data and analytics people were a little bit like auditors in advertising and media. They were kind of useful at the end of the year for the review and the rewards and making sure you could qualify what you were doing. They had a point of view, but definitely in the background. Well, I'm here to say that's not the case anymore. The analysts, the data, they're alongside everybody else. We know that data has exploded over the last two decades, but technology has caught up. So we are witnessing an unprecedented opportunity to combine data analytics and technology to give you a real view of the whole customer, what we call the total customer. No longer working independently, fully integrated, connected, quick, intelligent, accessible, of course. And perhaps most of all, leveraging the advances in AI and machine learning to look forward and enable us to plan and predict and embrace the future with real confidences. Of course, we still need disruptive and inspiring, you know, uh, defining creative ideas. But the power of real purchasing behavior, the attitudes and attributes of unprecedented scale surely has to beat six sweaty men in Surrey in a gym. So connection and context are perhaps the biggest two conjoined elements of opportunity for our marketing generation. It's one thing to have multiple data sets, but it's something altogether different when this can all be connected and informed with the expression and the language of impactful advertising and marketing. Using the understanding of shopping habits of a person in a store, online, through e-commerce, through convenience, and through quick commerce has to be and is the future. Wouldn't you love to know how the changes in shoppers' behaviors could be used in adapted advertising and marketing communications? It's really a change that's existed for a long time, and the, uh, the marketing industry has to embrace it now, because the CPGs and the retailers already have this information. So let me give you an example of what we mean. Right now, through our market measurement work in the UK, we know that beer sales in convenience stores are slipping. But we also know that beer sales in the multiples is growing. Now that could be because it's more cost effective for a consumer, that could be more choice. It could actually be, it's a more planned purchase. It's more considered, it's less spontaneous. Another thing which I think is particularly interesting as well, is we know in households today where there are dogs and there are babies, baby food is being traded down from premium to own brand. Dog food is not. 
whatever you're thinking, keep it to yourself, you can get yourself into terrible trouble. But the facts are, the information in real time exists and it can be hugely informing. You're already thinking about how do I market dog food to a baby, I know, it's a difficult concept. But let's stretch this a little further, if you own a brand, imagine taking it into a wholly elastic, individualized pricing scenario. Imagine including own brands in all of your analysis, don't ignore them, they're in the basket. So what this means for the future really, or for today more likely, is that we're talking about the whole store, the whole basket, and the whole customer. No hunches, no guesses, just real precision. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna introduce you to Carl Carter who works for us at IRI, who's leading this practice for us across the world. This is a very, very successful opportunity for all marketers and the brands and the marketers we are working with are embracing it. We're gonna show you a little bit of that today. So let me hand it across to Carl. Thank you. So look, I'm here to debunk the hunch. Let's kill it once and for all, yeah? But let's not do it through hunch or guesswork. Let's look at some evidence and some clear data points that allow us to do that. So this person here is not Mr. Rawlings, my year 10 geography teacher. I really hope Byron Sharp isn't here now, I've said that. This is Byron Sharp, and in 2010, he produced a book called How Brands Grow. That book has become the playbook for CPG manufacturers in how to market. And in his research, he talks about three real rules for driving brand growth. And these are based on decades of research. The first thing he talks about is physical availability. Physical availability is the concept that your product has to be available for someone to buy either in store or online. Pretty simple, right? He then talks about a concept that we're more familiar with here, which is mental availability. How do you ensure that your brand is front of mind so that when consumers want to make a decision and purchase, they choose your brand instead of someone else's? And lastly, which seems quite obvious, is to stay competitive, duh. But staying competitive means getting your price right, your promotional strategy right, but more importantly, making sure your product appeals to the widest audience possible because that will drive growth. But here's the reality that we see. Most campaigns don't ever condi uh, consider distribution or what we call physical availability. Lots of empty shelves or products not even available. And let me give you three evidence points towards this. New product launches are a great example where we see that, say for three quarters of the, the length of a campaign, the product is not actually available at critical mass. What I mean by that is, the product might be available in one or two retail stores, say a Waitrose and an Asda, but it's not available across the full estate. What does that mean? Well, if you spend eight out of 12 weeks of a media campaign pushing a product that no one can buy, guess what happens to the return on ad spend? You guessed it, it's pretty poor. In fact, it's shit, to be blunt. So we make these assumptions in availability. We believe that if we have a superstore that ranges the product, well, of course, the smaller format store, the metro stores also have it. They don't. Again, it's an assumption. And the last one is the one that makes me laugh on a weekly basis. To any advertisers and brands out there who supply us with a, a supplying list of stocking stores, nine out of 10 of those lists are completely inaccurate. They contain stores that don't sell the product, or even worse, we find in our data stores that are selling the product. Immediately, you can see the, the issue with marketing effectiveness. So look, there needs to be more collaboration with data and planning. And boy, this one's a big topic, right? How do you build mental availability today? You'll see across this, this great event, there are so many people talking about attention. But how do you do that right now? We have an environment that is multi-channel. People are buying products, as Ewan said, e-commerce, bricks and mortar, D2C, quick commerce. It's difficult to keep up, right? Not just that, but it's a multi-touch environment. Addressable media, non-addressable media, social platforms, apps. It's exhausting. How do you spread your money? And when it's an attention-based economy, how do you cut through the noise? It's pretty gloomy up here, isn't it? 
But let's talk about staying competitive as well. And I think as you and touched on, I think there's some really critical points for any of you media planners out there. We're in a very price sensitive market. Yeah, consumers care about price. And they're trading in a way they never traded once before. Right, let me give you an example. Now it's public knowledge, I feel free to talk about it. In the last week, we've seen Kraft Heinz, who makes some of our beloved products in the UK. Tomato, tomato sauce? Everyone's nodding. Oh, yeah, tomato sauce. Love tomato sauce. Yeah, baked beans. What if you can't buy them? What if you couldn't find them on the shelf? What happens? You go to the next best product, right? Well, that happened. So between Tesco's and Kraft Heinz, they couldn't reach an agreement. Why? Because Kraft Heinz are seeing massive increases in the cost to produce their goods. They want to pass some of that on to consumers. Tesco's want to protect your wallet which means they get more loyalty, and of course they would. But that is a juxtaposition. And what it ended up with is a scenario where they basically wouldn't have the product on the shelf. You see the challenge if you're the marketer trying to invest in that and plan against that. It's a huge issue. And again, back to the dynamic retail space that we're in. The UK is one of the most competitive retail spaces globally. Lots of retailers. Again, we talked about multi-channel e-commerce, bricks and mortar, D2C, quick commerce. How do you remain competitive when you're having to do price strategies, promotional strategies across so many touch points? Yeah? You need the right data to support that. So look, I've done the gloomy bit. Let's get into some positive bits with a, a blue watermelon or a honey, honeydew melon. Sorry, someone's going to call me out on that one. So context and connection, as Ewan said, become an important currency to kill the hunch. And what do I mean by that? You have to represent the market with your data. As a business, we see 98% of the sales that happen across the grocery sector. What does that mean? That means with machine learning models, we dig into that data and we find the needle in the haystack. We say, we know where distribution is good. We know where rate of sale is optimal. Therefore, these are the stores, these are the points of purchase you should invest in. Not only that, but we also look at the sales trends. So we know where a brand is underperforming versus overperforming. We know that the category may be in demand or actually the category may be in decline. What do you do as a media planner when you're investing your client's money in a category no is in decline? You have to use data and evidence to have that conversation to plan better. And that is fundamentally what we're about. But as a business, we cannot do that with our own data sets alone. So we believe the most important thing here is collaboration. That will resolve the industry's challenges. First party data is a hot topic right now. Retail media spaces are exploding and they're hugely important if you're investing in reaching consumers. But let me be very, very clear. I've been doing this for over 10 years. A lot over 10 years if you look at my face. Um, but here's what I know. There is not one client I have met globally who has enough first party data to reach an audience to continue to grow their business. There is not. So we have to blend data. We have to use the broader data sets that we have today. Single retail will not do it. This is one of my favorites. At my heart, I'm a creative. Attention needed to come to the forefront much sooner. So we believe if you had the right signals around purchase propensity, knowing where people are most likely to buy a product, and you blended that with high attention audiences, so people who are giving their time and attention, plus attention optimized creative, what a powerful intersection of data points. What would your ROI look like then? You look at the work that Lumin are doing, Amplified Intelligence, and then the guys over at Dragonfly. I mean, powerful, so powerful if you connect the data. And lastly, for some of the people in this room that I've worked with for many years, it's location data. You think about people at home, at work, on the go. When you visit the gym, when you go to the supermarket X times a week, intersecting the purchase propensity for brands you love with the moment in which you're there to make that purchase. Isn't that a critical moment, a zero moment of truth? And look, I cannot proclaim enough, coverage is key. And yeah, this is the data that I sit on. I'm very privileged with the rest of the business that we work on this data set. But I'm privileged, and so is the rest of our ride, because we get to see things that other people don't see. And we want to share that. We want you to see what we see. But look, let me be really clear. Our mission is to get our data 
and your data working together. It's to put it in places like LiveRamp, AdSquare, and IOTA. Jessica's there from IOTA, wink. But also, we're going one step further, and this is about direct integration into things like DSPs. Why is this important? Why? Because you can then integrate this data for planning, but not just planning. You can optimize in flight using our data. And we're doing this with great businesses like Bliss, Hawk, Skyrise, LoopMe, some very, some very big names in the DSP space. And look, channel doesn't matter. We are agnostic. Whether you're an addressable media or non-addressable media, we have data that connects, whether it be by geo or by audience. So look, let me end it here. We have many leading brands taking a hunchless approach. The question is, why aren't you? Come and see us at C11, near a bar. What more could you ask for? Thank you. Standing.